So like Pastor Mark said, um, we were actually expecting Pastor Justin to be here this week. And so it was last night that uh, we were actually at um, a Phil Wickham concert, and Brandon Lake concert, and that's when they got the call um, to come in. Um, so a lot of these guys weren't planning to do what they had to do today, and uh, Ricardo especially right here. Uh, got called around midnight to ask to lead two songs. So thank you so much for doing that, and we appreciate your leadership. Um, so we, uh, we keep them in, in our prayers, and, and we are just um, hoping and praying that uh, everything come out smoothly, and we just want to know the name of the baby. We've tried to pull it out of, out of Justin. He's not budging. Um, so we are all putting our bets on what it's going to be. We just call it Baby Bada. That's what I... I call it up up until now. Um, But I want to start with an apology. I feel like I owe some of you an apology. Let me explain why. A few weeks ago, I spoke for our night of worship. If you were there, um, it was an amazing night. People were prayed over. Um, An amazing experience, especially for me, and that has to do with why um, I feel like I'm, I'm, uh, I owe some of you an apology. Uh, a, I won't name the person, but uh, a, a member came to me and said, my mother-in-law is so angry with you. And I'm like, why is, why is she upset? And he's like, well, it happened at night of worship. And I'm like, what did I, did I say something to offend somebody? Um, you know, what, what in the world did I, did I say? I'm trying to like go over what I talked about. And he said, you never gave an update or gave us the story of what happened to your baby, Isla. And if you were there, you heard the story, and I will make it really quick and very brief. But we were in Puerto Rico. My grandmother um, passed away, and we were at a funeral. And on the back end of that trip, Isla, who was at at the time 10 months or 11 months, uh, she got really sick and got a fever and went up to 107. And yeah, it's it was terrifying uh especially being somewhere that it's just not home for you and um so i was explaining that story and i never said what happened at the end of it well she's here so she's okay i could do the whole lion king and bring her out and so that you guys can see that she's fine um but to be honest we didn't know the outcome at the time i was coming here to my community sharing So I really didn't have an answer. It wasn't until after we found out it was a virus and a rash broke out um, and we were praying for a rash. That was, was, I believe it's called roseola is what she ended up having. We were praying for that because then we knew what it was. We could identify the problem and they could give us what we needed for it. Um, So it was after that that we actually got some closure and figured out what it was. So if you're here, mother-in-law who's angry at me, she's okay. As a mother, I understand. You want to know what happened. She's fine. Um, But at the time, we didn't know. And I was coming up here just being vulnerable and saying, pray for my daughter who's doing not so well. Um, But in the midst of all that, the point of what we talked about that night was in the midst of the chaos and the stress and the unknown, God was still doing miracles. Um, he made a way for us to come back, and, and there was a lot to that story. I'd love to explain it to you um, if I had the time. But in the midst of all that, God was still working and still moving. And I hope anyone else who was here wasn't, you know, uh, upset that I left you with a cliffhanger, and this is the second episode to my story. Um, but that was a cliffhanger, I understand, and she is okay. She's here. You might hear her crying and yelling, and that's, that's a good thing for us. So um, she's doing much better. But... It leads me to my next point that maybe this has happened to you. And maybe you've been telling a story. You've been giving your testimony or or you're telling someone something about exciting news that's happened to you or a story at work. And you're explaining every single detail to a person. And you get to the end of your story and you realize the person that you told, they got hung up on a minor detail. That all their attention was focused on the one thing that you weren't really trying to get to. It's like, you missed the point. What I'm trying to tell you is this. But that one person just can't get over the one detail. And we get 
there are things as humans that when we hear stories that stick out to us because just, it's just how we are, our, our, our history, our, who we are, our biases, our experiences, will, will, some things will impact us more than others. And maybe you, that's been you. You've been telling a story and the person completely missed the point of what you were trying to say. And I'm sure that some of you can relate, and, and maybe you're that person who gets hung up on the details. And I have a, have a friend who loves to do that. And I'm like, that's not the point. Don't, don't worry about that. I'm trying to tell you this. We get hung up on something that isn't the main thing. Acts chapter 11, as Mark, uh, Pastor Mark was introducing it earlier, tells a story of something that is similar to what uh, I was just talking about. And if you were reading in Acts chapter 10, you know that there has been, there have been miracles that have just occurred. And, and Peter has just talked about the baptism of unbelievers. He shared the news with believers about the baptism, baptisms of unbelievers. And so he's sharing all this and, and he's talking about all the good stuff that has happened. And immediately the first thing that, the, that Jerusalem, the, the, that the, the people respond to is the fact that he's associating himself with unbelievers. They forget, they dismiss the miracle of what God has been doing in the hearts of unbelievers be, because Peter has gone and associated himself with the unclean. They can't get over that. And Peter says, you're missing the point. God has done amazing work and people are coming to Jesus and giving their lives over to Jesus. And they say, but you were with unbelievers? Their eyes were focused on something that wasn't the main thing, on a minor detail. How many times have we witnessed God's work being overshadowed by something irrelevant, where God has placed a specific call on us, and some, hey, some way, somehow, Satan steers the direction of our attention to something that isn't important, to divide us, to make us, to make an issue so big that it takes us away from our mission, to spread the good news, to live the gospel. See, the church for so long, and if you've been in church for a while, you know that, you know, the, the, the text and, and, and the word of we're in the world, but we're not, what, of the world. But for so long, so many times throughout history, we say we're in the world, not of the world, but sometimes we look just like the world. Because we let things, minor things, take over the major thing. We let issues separate us instead of coming together in the name of Jesus. And so we see the division and we see the hate and we see the chaos in the world. But sometimes we look just like that because we've taken our eyes off of the main thing. Acts 11 verse 19. This is such a, a pivotal point in the, in the book of Acts, and, and what we will soon realize that it, now, now identity is beginning to take shape. Up until now, there's unbelievers and believers, there's, there's people coming together, but now there is a, a label that will now be put upon a certain group of people. And I know this generation doesn't love labels, they don't like the idea of being tagged with something because that comes with responsibility. We don't like the terms being put on us, and I don't, I'm not, I don't like labels. Don't give me labels. But here, this label is different. This is a forming of people, and this is the first time that the word Christian is being used in the church of Antioch. Christianity is beginning to be formed. In verse 19, if you remember when the stoning of Stephen took place, you know that there was a mass scattering of people because Stephen has now been persecuted 
And now there's fear for the ones who believe like Stephen that they're also going to be persecuted. And so there is a mass scattering. People just start running all over the place. They start moving to different places. And, and I, I can't imagine this scene, but I imagine that, I mean, it was chaos because lives were at stake. People's lives were on the line. Um, I, I watched a show called The Morning Show. Um, it's on Apple TV. I just because I love Steve Carell because of The Office. But um, lately, uh, in the last episode, I can't remember, they actually um, are going over a current event, and, and it's about a, a, a news anchor who wants to cover the coronavirus. And it's at the very beginning of it when, when we don't know much about it, and he's talking about how there's this thing in, in, in Wuhan, and he wants to go do it. So he goes to cover the story, and he gets woken up in the middle of the night. And it's just really interesting because we, you know, we've obviously lived through this and still living through it currently. Um, but he gets woken up and, and by his coworker and he says, man, we have to go. Uh, they're, they're about to lock this city down and no one can come in or come out. And so he gets up and he's getting his stuff and there's just, they go into the streets and people are just trying to jump on trains and, and, and get out of town before there is a lockdown and they're trying to get back to the U.S., and there's just this crazy just uproar of people and fear because lives potentially are at stake. They're far ahead of what we, are, we were about to experience. And so there is this commotion. And, and, and I mean, people are doing whatever they can. No one cares about nobody else except for their family. And they're just trying to get from one place to another. And I can imagine that here when lives are at stake, there is a scramble. There's chaos. People do not want to face persecution but what we know that is that what we studied a few months ago that in the midst of the chaos God is about to do something big in the midst of the chaos people stay true to their calling the early church stayed true to their calling and so throughout this disruption people now move to different parts of the world and begin to still share the good news which is Jesus Verse 20, the key word, uh, actually going back in verse 19 at the very end, and I'll read it to you um, briefly. Verse 19 says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed and traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Up until this point, the only people that have been hearing about the gospel are the Jewish people. And that's key because what comes next is, however, things are about to change. It's no longer the Jews who are only going to, to hear the good news and about what Jesus has done. It says, however, men from Cyprus, Cyrene, went changed, and it's always been one purpose. It's Jesus to bring people together. No matter from where you are, where you've come from, where you live what side of whatever you fall on. The purpose of the church from the very beginning was to bring people together from different walks of life, different beliefs, under one name, and that was Jesus. And here, when identity is being formed and Christianity is now being labeled, it happens at a time when both Jews and Gentiles are becoming believers, are accepting Jesus It's more than just one group of people. The word of God begins to spread because of this disruption, because of this chaos. The gospel has never been intended to divide, but to unify a body of believers who share one common thing, a love for the Son of God. Verse 21, and I, I love what happens next because to someone hearing this, like we said, we would share similar concerns. Why are you talking to the heathens, to those unclean people? And Luke says, in case you forgot, you were only made clean because of the cross. In case you forgot, you were also in need of a savior. Don't forget where you came from. We're all in the same boat. And if that isn't enough, he says, I'm here to tell you that the Lord's hand was on them. Verse 20, 23, it says, when he arrived, or back, back a little bit, 20, 21, 
says the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So he says, in case you forgot, in case you didn't think that God's hand was in this, that he was involved, he was and many people turned to him that day. We know that in the book of Acts, thousands of people give their lives to Christ. And if there was any doubt, we know that a great number of people were brought to the Lord, and this was the Lord's doing, sending these men out to a foreign land to where death was upon them, according to a different group of people, and they brought life in the name of Jesus. And the Lord's hand was upon them, and a great number of people gave their life to the Lord. It isn't the first time something like this has happened. So what, what we see is that there is this idea of life being restored to a group of people. And, and Jerusalem, the people in Jerusalem, they just, they can't believe what they've heard. There's like, there's no way that people are believers now, are now part of the chosen group in this area. We don't believe it. So they send Barnabas out to go see it. And so now the believer becomes the unbeliever. They can't, they, they can't imagine how something like this would happen because they have, they have had this perception of what God was supposed to do. And this was not it. This, in their minds, was not part of the plan. The, unbelie the believers become the unbelievers. Unbelieving to what the power of the gospel could actually do, who it could actually reach and impact. Not only that, but it was also intended for more than just who they thought. Jesus' name was intended to spread all over the world. Have you ever wondered if we've become that way? Maybe that's a question that you ask yourself, you reflect on this community, or you've experienced this before, but have we become that way, that we think we have God figured out? We've done all the math, we got all the dates in order, 70 AD, 1844, 1888, stoning of Stephen, like we, we got it all, like straight down to a T, we've got God figured out. And so when he does something that isn't part of what we think is his plan, we say there's no way that's God doing that. Have we become, at some point, the unbeliever? The chosen, the, the remnant people, have we doubted what God can actually do because it doesn't fit within our box within our equation of who God's supposed to be. What we see here is that the people of Jerusalem, they need to see it for themselves. They need someone to go out as proof, send someone out to go see if there is life. Similar to what Noah did on the ark, sends a dove out because there is no existence of life. And we know what happens in, in the story of Noah, what the dove brings back. But here, the people of Jerusalem send someone out because they don't believe that life has been given to these groups of people. And what Barnabas sees is what? He sees a change. He sees people that have given their lives to Jesus. When he arrives, verse 23, says, when he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad, and he encouraged them to all remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Here what we see is Barnabas going to a group and he sees that there are new believers. He sees that a change has occurred. 
And his job was simply to go and see and report back what he has seen. And he could have simply observed and said, oh, they'll be fine. They've just accepted Jesus. Instead, he's intentional because he knows the value of discipleship. He's intentional and he gives them encouragement and he walks with them. And he knows that this is the time that the devil is going to try the hardest. They've given their lives to Jesus And he wants to encourage and affirm and walk alongside them and say, hey, you have made the best decision of your life. You've given your life to Christ. I want to journey with you. I want to make sure that you're okay. I want to follow up with you. Maybe some of you know of a new believer. And I know that there are some in here because we've baptized some. And we know that people, we have worked with people who are going through Bible studies. And if you don't know of anyone, I encourage you to start building relationships. But there are people in this room who've just given their life to Christ. And that isn't the point where we say they're fine, they'll be okay. That's when they need our community, need you the most. And Barnabas sees that and he stays and he encourages and he uplifts and he walks with. And that is our call as believers is to walk with, journey with, affirm, encourage, uplift, be there for our community. Regardless if you're a new believer or an old believer, this is our calling, is to do life together. And if we have seen anything at what church looks like in the book of Acts, it's doing life together. Specifically here to the new believers. So there's intention in Barnabas to walk with, to journey, to have conversation with these people. Like Rob said earlier, you could come here, leave and use it as a rental car, but this church is already yours. This community is yours. This is your community. And as your community, it is your responsibility, my responsibility to walk together, to journey with. And we meet it with our, as we meet with our pastoral staff and, and, and um, Pastor Mark, Pastor Justin, specifically for Warehouse, the discipleship word has been kind of a, a reoccurring theme. God's put it on our hearts. What does that look like? How are we going to be journeying with people? How do we disciple? How, is, how do we know that we're doing that? Doing a good job at the idea of discipling, walking with one, another, with one another, are we doing that? It's our call, it's our duty, it's our obligation. It was at the very beginning of Christianity, and it, it is what God, it is what Jesus did with his disciples, and he left it for an example for us to continue to do. I used to love watching illusions on TV. Tricks. I love it. And if you can do card tricks or any kind of trick, please show me. I will watch all day long. I love to try and figure it out. Uh, I have a friend. His name is Clark. And um, he's like an amazing, talented graphic designer. He's done stuff for like Star Wars and Nike and did like the album cover for Lecrae. And his hidden talent is to do tricks. And I met him at a coffee shop. And I mean, I, I sat there at least for like 45 minutes just like trying to figure out like what, how he, and I, you know, I caught a couple. I'm like, I see what you did. You know, like I, I know how you, how you did that. And, um, but I love them when anyone says they have a trick, I'm all in. Like I, I drop everything just, just to see um, what exactly is going to happen. And, and growing up, I used to watch this show. I don't even remember the name of it. Uh, but it was on cable TV. If you don't know what cable TV is, there's like commercials. You can't fast forward or rewind. You just have to like watch what's in front of you. Like you have no choice. It's crazy. Um, but I would watch this show and it was a show about how they did all these tricks. And the first half of the show was they, they, they performed it. It was on a stage and... Um, I can't, I think it was like David Copperfield, I can't remember. 
Um, do you, do you, did you watch that too? Anyway, it was so good. And I remember I would sit there and it's like, you know, stay tuned. If you watch till the end, we'll show you how we did it. So like they sucked me and I there for an hour. I'm like, I'm done. And so you'd watch it and I'm like sitting there like trying to figure out like why there's a mirror here and like what's this person over here doing? Like I, I'm trying to figure it out and you know, they'd show you how they how a person gets out of a, a tub that's full of water and they're in a straight jacket or whatever, or they put swords in the box, all that crazy stuff. And I'm like, there's no way, obviously they didn't do that. And so you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to like, and all this stuff is like happening all, all around. And, and it's just like, ah, I'm trying to figure this thing out. And at 635, they show you how it's done. And they, they, they end up telling you like how this person got out and how, how they took your eyes away from what was happening so they could do what they needed to do. They could slide the hand. They could get this person out. They'd use a mirror that had a reflection that looked at a different box to, you know, just to, to get you focused on something else other than the main thing. I think about that, and I think about how many times Satan has taken us off the main thing. How many times he's taken an issue, and you, you pick... You pick the issue. In our church, you can pick many. Women's ordination. The way you dress. The instruments you play. We take those issues and we let them divide our community. We let politics divide us. We let preferences of style divide We let minor things overcome the major thing. We say we don't want to be of the world, but sometimes we look just like it. And Satan takes our eyes and our attention and puts it on something else, and it occupies us for years. For years, we debate and we argue over something that isn't even the main thing has nothing to do with Jesus. So much so that we go down this route and at the very end, people find themselves arguing just for the sake of it to be right. It doesn't even matter about Jesus anymore. They just want their side to be right. I know I've, I'm guilty of it. It's easy to get caught up in the details, to obsess over things that really, in the end of the day, they don't really matter the church of Antioch when Christianity is formed Jesus is bringing together two groups of people who believe very differently one who's called unclean, the others are clean unbelievers, believers and he says none of that matters preach Jesus come together in my name because that is all that matters When the church begins to come together and it gets the name Christianity, it's at a point where two different groups figure out a way to put it all aside and come together in one name. You can't deny that the outcome of what happened in the church of Antioch was not God-ordained. And what Peter did earlier following the work of the Holy Spirit God's hand was all in it and it says the Lord's hand was on it and many people gave their life that day here's the last thing I want to say the mission the purpose of the church was to do one thing to unify people to the name of Jesus not to be a pulpit for politics or a destination for disagreements the church was meant to bring people together and make us realize that at the end of the day, nothing else mattered but our love for each other and for Jesus. That was the unifying message that brought the Jews and Gentiles alike. And that is the message that will carry us through the current state of this world. One name, one mission, one thing, the main thing, Jesus. 
not to be distracted, not to let the devil take our eyes away from the main thing and get caught up in the details, but to have an understanding that we can love each other in the midst of our differences. That is what Jesus died for. At the end of the day, we're all wrong. We're all sinners in need of saving. No matter how much math you've done, how many numbers you've figured out, whether you think you're part of the remnant or not, how many scriptures you've memorized, don't forget who you were. Don't forget that you were also a sinner in need of saving. there are many out there who are hurting, who are searching, who feel like they don't belong, who need to know the name of Jesus. Don't let your minor differences get in the way of talking about Jesus, loving each other, coming together as a community, putting all that aside. Because as we believe in the second advent, all that's going to go away. There'll be no sides. We'll come together in one name. And we'll sing of one name. That's Jesus. Our only right is to proclaim his name. The focus has always been him. No matter what distraction, whatever Satan tries to throw your way, it's not bigger than Jesus. It's not bigger than what he did. It's not bigger than his grace. His forgiveness triumphs over anything. Notice what happens towards the end of chapter 11. Not one of the disciples was sent to do this task. It wasn't a group of pastors. It was believers. That's it. You don't want to be, you don't have a label, don't have one. You still have a purpose. You still have a mission to share the good news. Kingdom growth is not dependent on just leaders in the church and pastors. Kingdom growth is based on each and every one of you to respond to his call and to share the good news. What happens in verses 28 through 30 is classic acts stuff that happens throughout all the book one of them named Agabus stood up and through the spirit predicted that there was severe famine that was going to spread through the entire Roman world the disciples as each one was able decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea this they did sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul classic acts giving when someone needed giving of themselves walking with, journeying with, asking what do you need? How can we pray for you? How can I encourage you? It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what team you cheer for, what side you fall on. I don't care. I want to pray for you. I want to encourage you. I want to love you. I want to give of myself. It didn't matter to Jesus what we had done, what we do, what you do. It doesn't matter because his grace is bigger than that. His love is greater than anything you've done, you've committed. And as a Christian body, as as if you call yourself a, a, a believer, that is your response, your responsibility to one another. It's to encourage, to walk, to forgive, to walk with in love and to journey with, to give of yourselves. This is how the church grew. This is how the early church was so successful and how we still talk about it and how we still call ourselves Christians till this day. It was a community that put everything aside and had one focus. What does that look like for you? What does that look like for Forest Lake Church, a warehouse community, to journey with, to walk along, to know that our mission is one thing Nothing else matters. Put your biases aside. Put your hate, your love for things maybe different than one another. 
put it aside for Jesus. Father God, Lord, we thank you for your forgiveness, your love, and how in the midst of the world that we live in, there's distractions, there are things that draw us away from the main thing, from you. May you draw our eyes, our attention, our lives to you. May what we do in this place point to you. When we walk out of here, may we just reflect Jesus, nothing else. Because nothing else matters. We ask that this place be a place of love, of forgiveness, of acceptance. This is what you did for us. So may we resemble you as much as we humanly possibly can through your grace and your mercy and through your spirit. 